I do feel like I have an impact, but more as a chorus member, not as like a soloist. So a lot of times I'm just giving my opinion and I discover that, yeah, two other reviewers or, or three other Instagram um, influencers, whatever you might want to call them, they had the same perspective, same idea. Um, and so it just ends up confirming to the maker, yeah, this is definitely something that needs to be changed. Yeah, so I think I'm more of a chorus member than a soloist. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your hosts, Jim Person and Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Hello, Knife Junkie, and welcome to episode number 92 of the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Jim Person. And I'm Bob DeMarco. Welcome to the show. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, the place for knife newbies and knife junkies to learn all about knives and knife collecting, hear from knife designers, makers, manufacturers, YouTube knife reviewers, anyone who loves knives. That's what we're all about on the weekend interview show. And we've got another YouTube knife reviewer with us today, Bob. Uh, just an interesting, uh, interesting interview. I, I really uh, am looking forward to it. Yeah, we had uh, Eugene Kwan on the show, and he's one of my uh, my new favorite YouTubers. Not that he's new, but I'm new to him, relatively. I've been listening to him for about maybe six months, listening slash watching. And uh, he, he can just really articulate uh, things about knives that, um, you know, he'll say something and I, and I say, I wish I said that. I wish I, I was able to clarify my thinking that way. And uh, I just, I just generally uh, love his reviews. He does. He has two series. One of them is called uh, Dashboard Reviews, where he reviews a lot of new knives and prototypes. I mean, this guy gets his hands on prototypes uh, like crazy, and he reviews them in his car, and they're just, uh, they're great. And uh, he also has another review, uh, another series called Are We There Yet? That I also love, where he handles these prototypes and actually talks about them and what improvements could be made and and this and mm. that and uh, right. yeah so Eugene Kwan great YouTuber and it was great to catch up with him that interview is coming up next but uh, I do want to remind you that uh, Bob's YouTube channel can be found at the knifejunkie.com slash YouTube and that's where you'll also find the Thursday Night Knives live video show where Bob and uh, special guest co-host every Thursday go uh, into the weeds and talk knives but it's also your chance to uh, to join in via the comments section and or on the show. If you have uh, a knife to sell, uh, the Knife Junkie is uh, opening up his Thursday Night Knives live show platform to you. So you can come on. All you got to do is have a webcam and a microphone and show off that knife you want to sell and uh, talk about it and uh, all free of charge. The KnifeJunkie.com slash YouTube. You can find it Thursday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern. Also on the Knife Junkies Facebook page at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. So, Eugene, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie podcast. I, I appreciate your coming on. Oh, thank you so much for having me. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Excellent. Excellent. So, uh, let me start the conversation by asking you uh, uh, an invasive question, and that is, what did you have in your pocket today? Well, today I had something in my pocket that I hadn't had uh, on any other day. Uh, I had just got this out of the mail. It was my long-awaited uh, Sharp by Design uh, oh, Void. Uh, the, uh, the one that I ended up pre-ordering had the damaged steel blade and the PVD-coated handle with that large aspiration going down the body. And yeah, I I think that the pre-orders for this actually closed around thanksgiving last year mm -hmm. so it's been a long wait and then of course with the virus and everything everything got slowed down even further uh but yeah i got this out of the mail today and it hasn't left my pocket or my hand since his knives to me are are just man they're they are way up there in the master class definitely yeah he does some great work i would one day love to somehow come upon an, an archangel because to oh, me that yeah <laughs> that is like the most beautiful folding knife ever ever built as yeah. far as I'm concerned. Yeah, he's got this amazing eye for classic lines and not just good lines, but the right proportions to curves and transitions. Um, 
something about his knives look very modern, but at the same time, really preserve very classic kind of design influences, I think. So I don't know. It's just, I could, I could stare at a sharp eye design knife all day. So are you happy with it? Are your expectations met by this particular knife? I'm very impressed because in the mailbox today was also uh, one of the prototypes for his fully custom Void XL. He sent uh, a couple of them out to a few different reviewers. And so it was my turn to check it out. And the difference between the two, aside from the obvious differences of size and, you know, some design touches that needed to be tweaked for the production versus the custom, aside from some of those differences, these two knives are extremely close. I was very impressed with what a Riot was able to accomplish. And, and this, has, mm. this isn't their first ro rodeo with Brian, of course. They they have gotten used to his design style as well as some of the different unique quirks uh, that he CNCs into his knives and all that. Like the detent? Yes, exactly. So I, I, I was just going to say that, that I think that the detent on this void is even closer to the customs that Brian makes out of his own shop uh, than any of the other production collaborations have been so far. And, you know, those other ones, the Evil Typhoon and uh, the, the Micro Typhoon, they, they were very close, you know. So um, it's just cool to see Riot continuing to improve on their ability to work with his designs. Is that Riot uh, being offered in, a, in exotic materials, exotic steels and such? So the only uh, the only real full dress um, configuration is the Knife Nuts podcast exclusive. So, <laughs> yeah, I think wow. you had to pre-order that uh, a while back. But that's still being worked on right now as of this recording. So... Uh, it should it shouldn't be too much longer, but you know everything got super delayed in China um, for understandable reasons. Uh, mm -hmm. But that's still in production. But that's looking really nice as well. It also features a unique blade shape that wasn't available in the original pre order run. Um, this kind of clip point uh, that has the same cutting edge but a different spine than the mm -hmm. re the regular production voids that you we've been seeing. So it's got a little bit more of a, a buoy shape uh, from the yeah. opening hole down to the tip. Yeah, kind of this aggressive clip towards the front. It really gives it kind of a mean look. I, I like it a lot. So uh, is this a, a frequent thing, makers sending you their prototypes? Uh, the last video I saw of yours was the Vero Engineering Knife, and that also was a prototype. Yeah. And so how does that how does that work, and, and uh, do you feel like you have an impact on what uh, – on the final product? Mm. I, 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 honestly speaking, I, I'm kind of surprised that makers are willing to send me prototypes. Uh, just because my channel isn't the biggest channel out there, and I don't have the flashiest videos. Um, but uh, whenever I, I ask, or sometimes I am approached, um, people do respond positively. And they say, yeah, sure, I'd love to send out a prototype to you or anything like that. Um, so... Yeah, it, it kind of does surprise me, but uh, the way that I kind of approach things is if I'm following someone on Instagram and I see that they're coming out with a, a new design, if they have some prototypes ready, I just ask if there's like a list to be put on for a pass around. And most of the time, people just want more buzz around their knife, so they're willing to say yes. But there are a few makers who will actually reach out to me and just say, hey, why don't you take a look at this and let me know. But about two-thirds of the makers that I and designers that I've done uh, kind of prototype previewing for they've also got on the phone with me or or talked with me through dms and stuff like that about things that i think they should change for the design i do feel like i have an impact but more as a chorus member not as like a soloist so a lot of times i'm just giving my opinion and i discover that yeah, two other reviewers or or three other Instagram um, influencers, whatever you might want to call them, they had the same perspective, same idea. Um, and so it just ends up confirming to the maker, yeah, this is definitely something that needs right. to be changed. Yeah. So I think I'm more of a chorus member than a soloist, but yeah. Yeah, a specialized chorus, though. I mean, you know, there uh, people are not going to send out their prototypes just to – uh, people, because they have numbers, they're going to make sure that this person is looking for the right things and that this mm. person has the right temperament to review their knife before it's ready for showtime. <laughs> I, I guess that's true. That's true. Yeah, because you don't want to send a prototype to someone who might be known for just totally tearing down products uh, for the fun of it. And 
Or, yeah, or, stuff, or yeah. also uh, just singing the praises of everything all the time. Oh, my God, this is so cool. This right. is so cool. Yeah, it's not very constructive at that point. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so, I was wondering, you're out on the West Coast, correct? I am, yes. Okay. So, what is it like out there to be a knife lover where all these amazing knives are made, but there are a lot of crazy knife laws? Yeah. So, you know, the interesting thing about California is that even though there's a pretty strong stigma against guns and gun ownership, and there are a couple of restrictive knife laws, for example, according to my understanding, this is not legal advice, of course, no one should take it this way, mm-hmm. but according to my understanding, any balisong or switchblade slash automatic with a blade of over two inches in length cannot be carried in public. Um, there are a couple of laws like that, and then depending on what uh, municipality you're in, like if you're in L.A., uh, I think things change a little bit more. But actually, up here in Northern California and the Bay Area, uh, not only are the laws a little bit less restrictive, but even the the law enforcement officers that I talked with and, and been um, fortunate enough to interact with, they've all been very just open to say, you know, use your common sense kind mm-hmm. of thing. So even though it would seem like California is a very restrictive place with regard to knives, I haven't found it to be the case that caring has uh, gotten me into any kind of trouble or too many hang-ups with that. Really, the big thing is I just can't carry some autos that I really like. In addition, I, I, I actually recently got um, on board with the Bay Area Knife Collectors Association. Oh. And it's got members like Jim O. Young, um, some other reviewers like Therapeutic Edge and Women Carry Knives, you know, um, a bunch of other Bay Area locals gathering together once a month and and sometimes even between meetings for dinner and stuff. That's been a lot of fun. So through that, I've been able to meet a dozen, two dozen other fellow knife nuts within the immediate vicinity. So that's actually been quite a lot of fun. So uh, do you think the knife laws or the restrictions or uh, kind of a, ha- has that informed what you prefer to collect now? I want to, I want to find out a little bit about Ooh, your collection. Yeah. 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 So, my collection, hmm, it, it, I would say that it has had some influence because I've just gotten to the point where I want to collect knives that I can carry and enjoy throughout the day, you know. I used to collect just everything possible. Like, I wanted just to taste a little bit of everything everywhere. So, I had a bunch of autos I couldn't carry. I had a bunch of other knives that just wouldn't be practical to have on me. Uh, but I liked having them uh, because I just wanted to see and try and understand what would make someone want one, a knife like this or what would draw someone to a design like this. And so it was more of kind of an exploration. Um, but at this point in my collecting, uh, with a second baby on the way, um, mm-hmm. uh, I've had to be a little bit more frugal. And so now my knives have to do double duty. They have to be uh, interesting to me, um, but also carryable and usable at my workplace. So. Right, right. Well, best wishes on the on oh, the thank coming you. baby. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's... I'm trying to see if they'll let me cut the cord with one of my knives. They didn't. <laughs> they didn't let me last time. So, <laughs> well, what would it be? Ooh, what would it be? It would probably be my Koenig Arius. Oh, right now, yeah, that's the first one that comes to mind. Although there's a couple others that would definitely make the cut. No pun intended. Yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah. That's the one that uh, is kind of freshest on my mind because it was uh, my most recent big addition to my collection. I ended up getting one of the um, first batch Gen 4 style 57s. Um, so it was like, I think a batch of 20 of them and I got number 12. So that was a really big addition to my collection. What, uh, what distinguishes yeah. a style 57? So the Style 57 has its own unique milling pattern on the show scale as well as the lock scale. They have used that pattern on other non-Style 57 knives, I believe. Uh, But the Style 57 has evolved into its own kind of tour de force of what Koenig can do uh, in terms of fit and finish and uh, milling operations at a larger scale. So a Style 57 won't be quite as fancy or as nice as a full custom that Bill Koenig hand walks through the whole shop. But it definitely is, I think, the top of what uh, the company is able to do at 
again, a larger scale, like 20, 30, 40 knives or so. But this batch happened to be just 20. Uh, the I have yet to have a, a Koenig Arius myself. And um, I was trying to make myself not like it. So that oh, I wouldn't, <laughs> so that I wouldn't have to get it. But people keep, it, it just keeps coming back up. So how do you decide what to what to keep? You know, okay, mm. tell me, tell me what you decide to keep and how you decide what to review. It doesn't seem like your channel, like you're just grabbing anything um, sure. that's coming by for content. You really seem to have a um, a, a taste and a through line. What what is that? I would say that what I review is a little bit different from what I end up seeking out to keep for myself. So maybe I'll, I'll start with what I review. Um, to, uh, my criteria is actually pretty simple, um, at least simple to describe, but maybe not always easy to, to achieve, maybe. Um, but for me, if a knife has at least one strong characterizing feature that uh, I find makes it stand out from a group, then I'll be interested in reviewing it. It, it doesn't have to be a great EDC knife. It doesn't have to be uh, like the fanciest materials. It doesn't have to be uh, just kind of, I guess, perfect in every way. Um, but if there's something unique about it, that that's something I want to explore. Because again, kind of going back to what I had mentioned before, uh, what what got me really into connect collecting was these little things that would be different between one knife and another. And it would just make me wonder why, why make that choice or why make that change? You know, why go down that path as opposed to the other path? You know, why a drop point versus a sheep's foot? You know, why uh, a, a side opening auto versus a, out the front? Th those kind of choices, I mean, I think we, we make them just very instinctively, intuitively, subconsciously, but it's, interesting to me why someone would want to go with one choice versus another and that usually is enough of a hook to get me to request a knife to review or, or even buy one so that I can review it and try and understand it. I think a good example of this uh, was well maybe an extreme example of this was I don't know if you remember this knife but it was a it was a one made by Wee Knife Co. It's called the Double Helix. Uh, yes I do remember that. Yeah kind of a quirky knife with the, right? The odd closing uh, the yeah. odd lock. Yeah. Yeah, it had those exposed titanium coal, coil springs on the outside of the handle. Sort of steampunk almost, but, but, but right. usable steampunk. Yes, exactly. Yeah, something like that doesn't strike me as a very mm, practical everyday carry. You know, it's not a knife that you're going to want to be uh, relying on if you're in a real emergency situation or something. But it's a very interesting knife to me just because of that opening and closing mechanism. And that was enough for me to go out and put down the, the money and and get it in to see if I can possibly understand it. Uh, I ended up not keeping it, so maybe that says something about what I decided to keep. Uh, but I was willing to take the bath that I did on that just to try and understand what the knife is about. Well, it seems like uh, – well, you have two series. You have Dashboard Review uh, on your YouTube channel, that is. You have Dashboard Reviews and you have uh, Are We There Yet? And yeah. it seems like Are We There Yet, uh, which is a great uh, – well, explain what Are We There Yet is and uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. So, I think the dashboard reviews are pretty self-explanatory. I just review knives in my car, kind of a weird setup. But uh, the Are We There Yet is is just kind of a play on that whole road trip mentality of hoping to get to a destination and, and seeing if it was worth the drive. And that plays into the whole idea of checking out a prototype of a knife, you know. Um, so the knives that I cover in that series of videos is are all prototypes or knives that are in early pre-production stage. Um, and so the idea of the knife is there. The thing that's supposed to, you know, be its major hook is should already be present. Um, but it might have fit and finish issues. It might have some other um, kind of uh, geometry issues, engineering issues. Uh, but I'm willing to look past all that to see if I can understand the idea behind the knife. And if I can, then... Uh, hopefully, I can convey that and help other people decide whether it's enough of a good idea to uh, get them to pre-order the knife. Yeah, I mean, that seems like an especially useful tool to not only the buyer, but but the maker, too, because, mm. um, you know, if they're not responsive, if they're not listening to what people are saying, it, it will show, you know, in, in very um, concrete terms. 
Yes, very much. And and the commenters in, on YouTube, they are, they're not shy at all about letting uh, people know what they think. So <laughs> you, you had one recently, and I can't remember the name of it. Uh, maybe you'll you'll pick up on it. It was a, it was a dramatic tanto, black and red. Mm, the Necronaut. Yes. Yes. A, by, dramatic. Uh, arcane design. Yes. <laughs> that thing. Uh, I, I have one major design gripe with it, but that is a cool knife, but definitely not for everyone. Right, exactly. So, um, the, yeah, that Necronaut, uh, it's, I could see how it's a polarizing design. First of all, it's a Tanto, and a lot of people, mm-hmm. um, A, don't like them or are somehow convinced that they're not good EDC blades. I think they are. I just think maybe yeah. for, maybe for different applications or what have you. I think they're, I think they're probably good out in the out of doors too, but who knows? I'm, I'm not an outdoorsman. Yeah, I, I was surprised about about that knife and how much I enjoyed it, really. I, I think one of the big things for me is just because uh, during my day job, I'm I'm just breaking down so much cardboard. Mm-hmm. Um, I need a knife to be able to slice, and typically Tantos don't really offer that. But I think the, the ratio of the forward section to the rear section of the Tanto, I, I mentioned this in the video, um, it's about a 50-50 ratio, and so that ended up, kind of approximating the the curvature of a typical drop point for me. Um, right. And so as I was cutting through, I, I, I was actually surprising myself by how easily it was going. Um, I do think the design is is a bit polarizing. It If you look at it, it looks like a, a knife that should be in a video game. Yeah. <laughs> um, it even has that kind of aesthetic to it, right? The coloration yeah, and yes, everything. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So my, uh, I, I actually was, was uh, you know, when I saw it in the thumbnail, I was like, God, what is that? <laughs> and and I really I fell for it pretty quickly. Um, except I didn't like the big, uh, the big lock bar thing over by the pivot. I thought that was a little oh a, sure a little clunky. Yeah. But at the same time, mm-hmm. this is prototype phase. It, right, know, it's right, right. Uh, something different. But it it also reminds me a little bit of the same proportions of the of the Lee Williams um, flipper that you did recently. Actually, you know that it looks like the Hisatsu. Oh oh the oh the um. The Christopher, Christopher Williams. Williams. Christopher Williams. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That same so, sort of long, drawn-out tanto. Right, right. I, I, both of those knives uh, were interesting to me because I, I did want to kind of test that idea. Can a tanto, can an aggressive tanto um, or a dramatic tanto, as you put it, uh, really be useful day-to-day? And, uh, yeah, I do think that the Necronaut uh, was surprising in its usefulness. Um, the, his, the, it wasn't the Hisatsu, but it was similar to the CRKT Hisatsu. It's the, the OZF, the OZF002. That one, um, I found that once I kind of corrected the, the edge bevel that came on it from factory, it, it also performed very, very nicely. I, 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 I love carrying that knife. Um, it's just a lot of fun. It's <laughs> kind of atypical for me because I don't typically carry such aggressive looking blades. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I still really like using that. And man, it's super tough towards the tip. That's one of the things that I love about Tantos. You don't feel any of that hesitation going in there right. and just digging into something with that tip. I want to find out what your criteria are for your breakdown of a knife, for how you judge a knife, whether or not it's to your taste. What are some of the things mm-hmm. that it absolutely must achieve uh, for you to, you know, I think this is ugly, but if you like the design, this is a stellar knife. What are those details? Hmm. So I feel like this is something that I'm still in the process of discovering for myself. In that earlier stage, I told you about where I was just kind of buying anything that caught my eye and just was even remotely interesting. Uh, I think that was just a lot of me kind of getting the sense and lay of the land. But I would say that I'm at a point now where I'm actually just beginning to settle in on what I personally like or don't like. For a knife, generally, as I think back on on the the knives I've reviewed and enjoyed, I think the lines need to make aesthetic sense to me. Um, I do feel like, you know, as much as I appreciate Spyderco's philosophy of designing knives in the dark, you know, for ergonomics... (laughs) necessarily more than appearance as much as i appreciate that and you know spyderco was like my first love um one of my first major uh crushes in the knife world <laughs> um as much as that is true 
I do feel like a knife needs to have some visual balance to me. Um, I, I want to be able to say that I know what the designer was like had in his mind uh, with what he's doing with this line or that line or this transition. Why is he placing it here? Why is she um, directing the curve this way or to this degree? I want to be able to uh, get a sense for that. Even if I'm wrong, I want there to be at least some sense of cohesion to my eye. I know that's a very uh, kind of subjective thing to say, but that's a big important thing to me. And actually, the Necronaut is a good example of that. Even though the lines are not lines I would have personally drawn, the design itself is very cohesive. Got an internal logic. Yes, exactly. And I like that. I like that consistency about it. I do also feel like I'm just naturally drawn, if I'm going to be get a little bit more specific, um, I'm naturally drawn to clip points and drop points. And I think that comes from the more practical side of things. Uh, I'm finding that, again, as I'm trying to balance, you know, the needs of my family and my own hobbies, um, I need my knives to do that double duty. I need them to be attractive to me, but they also need to work well. Mm -hmm. And I just find that clip points and drop points tend to do that better than um, other more wild kind of uh, compound grinds or et cetera, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's so useful up at the front for this job and so useful back towards the back (laughs) for this job. (laughs) It's a multi-tool. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, blade centering, lock stick, mm-hmm. bad clips. Are, are, are there? What are the things that really, really stick in your craw? Make you want to send it back? Ooh, yeah. Well, lock stick is a major thing, and I have run into that with a few of my knives. I think more and more, um, the whole lock bar assembly thing, I think, is just really fraught because you have on one hand. Companies are trying to make their knives very safe. But then on the other hand, you have um, a consumer base that really wants that kind of drop free, free dropping action, you know, that that's supposed to speak to a certain level of quality. Mm -hmm. Right. And I totally get that. I I totally get the thrill of having a knife just guillotine shut um, because of how smooth it is and everything. Um, But I feel like that tension between both sides has resulted in knives that, yeah, just either don't lock up very safely um, or just aren't very fun to use. And so, yeah, I have encountered um, strange lock bars, lock stick, as well as lock bar engagement that's, gosh, less than the thickness of my hair. <laughs> Stuff like that just really drives me nuts. Um, I want a knife to be reliable. Um, I don't need it to have the strongest lock in the world, but I want it to do a consistent job at what it's supposed to do. So that kind of stuff does bother me. Blade centering is... At this point in the game, I feel like, especially when you look at what the Civivis of the world are able to mm-hmm. accomplish, um, uh, you, when, when, you, when you look at what overseas production is able to achieve, I just feel like centering should be a, a basic expected um, Like alignment uh, in your feature. car. Exactly, right? Yeah. So I'm not going to drive a car off the lot and say, well, you know, it keeps drifting to the right. I guess that's fine. Right? I'll like, just I tweak around something the... higher than that. <laughs> yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I got to do that at home, you know? <laughs> yeah. So that's why I actually don't even address some of those topics in my, in my video. I don't necessarily draw attention to it because uh, to me, if it's not centered, it's worth mentioning. But if it is centered, I mean, you should just expect that. You should just expect a centered blade. You should just expect a consistent lockup. Um, I think that uh, pocket clips, though, I'm a lot more lenient on. Um, I don't mind uh, tight or or even, you know, uh, very low pocket clips. Mm-hmm. Um, that doesn't bother me too much. Uh, even if a, a decent amount of the knife is exposed, it, it just doesn't really bug me all that much. I, I feel like there's pros and cons to having deep carry versus not. Mm-hmm. I don't even mind tip down, to be honest. I know that that's going a little bit against the the common grain, but I think that's also. I can't believe partly, you just said that on this. Podcast. I know, <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, I get so much flack for that, but um, among my friends, but yeah, I don't mind tip down because to me, I'm willing to just take the couple minutes that it takes to ingrain the muscle yes. memory into your hand. There's a new yeah. Alliance design knife that's tip down. I, I can't remember oh, the chisel. Yeah, the, mm-hmm. it's cool yeah. looking. Uh, that uh, mm-hmm. doesn't. Look, it's not exactly my my thing, but it's a. It looks like a beautiful little work of uh, work of design art, and mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. Uh, tipped down. And I thought, oh, how audacious! Yeah. It's like uh, right, <laughs> wow. 
It's very bold of them. Yeah, they're, he's, you know, they're putting themselves in the in the rarefied air of <laughs> the only two acceptable knives with tip down, which to me is the military and the and the uh, mm-hmm. SOCOM. And the SOCOM, of course. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because I like, uh, you know, high speed, low drag. You know, that's kind of my exactly. thing. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah. you, you mentioned the high-end Chinese manufacturers. I'm not sure how long you've been a knife lover, and I guess I should know by now. Uh so maybe you can tell me that too. But what have you seen uh, the injection of these high-end uh, 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 knife manufacturers from China in particular uh, in the knife market? What have they done? How have they helped us? What have they done? So I definitely think that these Chinese makers – so I started collecting in about 2013. So it hasn't been all that long. I've always been around pocket knives. I grew up in Indiana. So uh, the Midwest is very comfortable with that sort of thing. Um, but it wasn't until I moved out to California, ironically, that I actually started really getting into knives. Um, but yeah, I guess 2013 was just a little bit before the whole revolution led by We Knife Co. and Rayad and some of these others, Kaiser and all that. Um, and then, of course, uh, the second wave that hit was the introduction of their more budget lines like Civivi, um, Kaiser Vanguard, you know, these these lower price brands that still achieved extremely high levels of fit and finish and tolerance and such. I think that what one of the major things that they've done is really put American companies on notice to say that we can achieve this, we can do this at this price point. Um, so kind of either, either put up or shut up. Hmm. And I know that's a little bit harsh, but I feel like there there is an immense pressure coming from uh, from these Chinese uh, factories for American companies to kind of step up and and see if they can um, not necessarily woo back because I don't think they've lost their customers, mm-hmm. but to really um, kind of date their customers again, you know, seduce them a bit more and, and um, you know, kind of rekindle that love because it's just so easy for people to say, well, if this knife has these features and these materials, but it's coming in at this yeah. price, well, you know, it's hard to argue, you know. Um, I, I, yeah, I, I feel like you've seen the reaction from Gerber and from um, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Buck and from uh, Sog in the last two Absolutely. years, definitely Sog this year, where they're, yes. they're, ch- they're revamping their designs and adding colors and, you know, mm-hmm. adding a little joy, you know. Yes. <laughs> and, 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 and not only joy, but also the uh, manual action and, and, and mm-hmm. things that are being done for way less money so do you think do you think alliance and millet and companies like that will sort of uh, pick up the the torch over here in the united states and be the 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 oem to the the knife stars here do you think companies like that will start sprouting up in in competition well you know you see we is is putting out so many different knives from so many different designers Right, right there's a market for it so i'm wondering if america will pick up the mantle yeah you know, I, I do think that the Chinese OEMs, the factories, you know, and that's really what, what they're aiming to do, right? They're aiming to put out really audacious knife designs with incredibly um, intricate milling patterns, really high-end materials and all that. But the real real purpose behind all of that was just to say, hey, we can do this for you guys if you want to give us a design. Mm-hmm. If you give us your design, we'll make the knife for you because they knew that that's where the real money was going to be in the long run. Or at least, I, I think that that's their that was their philosophy, and so um, yeah, not only did it kind of wake up some of these big companies, but I think it also clued a lot of designers into the idea that oh, I don't need to go through this big company in order to get my idea into people's hands. I can work with one of these OEMs, and that in turn, I think, will inspire a lot of American companies to say, hey, we can actually do this too. We have all the machinery and all the skill and 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 know how to do this, and we're local, we're domestic. Um, so, yeah, I do think that the future is bright for American OEMs. Um, I, I'm i very excited to see, actually, ProTech, um, mm. uh, see if maybe they'll be able to uh, step in and fill some of that void a bit it more. It seems like they already are. Right? You know, with the, yeah, with the, yeah. the, tough, uh, the tough knives, the new uh, Arcform Slimfoot, and mm-hmm. the, uh, exactly. a number of others. Yeah, Fair and Forge, um, they, they ended up doing a collaboration with oh, them. Oh, yeah, the, I feel the like, Mordax. Yes, yeah, yeah. Now, if they can um, branch out from the button lock, if they can start doing a really great frame lock designs, which I think are just, you know, they've been hot forever. Mm-hmm. 
and there's no sign of that slowing down, I think they'll really be able to connect with um, even more designers and custom makers. Um, but you know, it's just it's just tough because in the U.S. we have robust labor laws and we right. have a lot of things that that go into hiring employees and making sure that you know they're making a living wage and all that, and that's all wonderful. Um, so, is it? The easiest thing to, to jump into, maybe not, but I do feel like it's it's an open avenue uh, for at least some companies. I, I remember reading a quote years and years ago, Steven Spielberg saying, you know, in the future, every little girl and boy is going to have a video camera in their pocket and they'll, you know, you won't have to go through the studio system to make something brilliant. Right. And uh, that that came to mind when I, uh, about Brian Nadeau, uh, mm-hmm. you know, he here, here's a guy who's making these incredible knives and doing very well and doing it all out of his garage, you know, that he retrofitted Mm -hmm. to fit Mm -hmm. his giant mill. So (laughs) in a way uh, that's kind of uh, begun to happen in this industry. And, and who knows, maybe as, as tabletop CNCs, you know, become a thing and, and uh, who knows what's going to happen with 3d printing. Maybe everyone's going to be, or, or, you know, maybe it's the sort of thing where you can be producing these things at home. Right. Right. I think that's, a really exciting future. Um, and you do see other companies as well getting into that, like uh, Brown Knives out in Seattle, as well as uh, Holt Blade Works, you know, in Iowa. And, um, uh, you know, there's there's a knife that I'm in the process of reviewing by a father and son team called uh, Skiff Made Blades. Mm. And so Stephen Skiff, uh, I think he might be the son. I, I might have that incorrect, but I'm still, still working through my research on it. But this knife, so the dad, he... He makes all of the blades and he custom finishes every single one uh, by hand. But then all the handles are CNC'd by his son. Um, They live a couple of hours apart. They collaborate together. They make sure that these knives come together as one piece. And they're just really fantastic knives. I mean, I'm just so blown away by them. Got to check that out. Skiff made knives? Skiff made blades. Made blades. Oh, yeah, that sounds good. And so, actually, if you're into um, uh, collecting or if you ever handle like higher end uh small batch custom uh frame lock folders you know bearing folders the bearings in them have a very high chance of coming from the skiff workshop they, they make some parts as well that they sell just in bulk kind of like you know? trm so, how they came yeah yeah a little bit like that yeah yeah uh, trm is another great example of of what, some of these smaller um companies who are kind of forging their own path I do think that the side effect of this, though, is going to be um, that there, there'll be just a lot of, as, as it becomes easier to produce knives, you'll probably get a lot of knives that maybe maybe should have gone through a little bit more of a filtering process. Ah, uh, um, yeah. You know? Yeah. Because right now, the market is just very crowded as mm-hmm. it is, but I, I feel like it's only getting more crowded, um, and... It's it's getting difficult to keep up with all the new knives that are coming out all the time. Yes, and uh, but I also feel like the the knife buying public is growing, and uh, mm, yes, yeah, and, demand is increasing too. Yeah. Yes, and and I think that um, evidence of that, like companies like Quiet Carry and James Brand and um, mm. knives that I affectionately call hipster knives, you know, <laughs> like but but that you know they're well made and they're they're very. Uh, very deliberately designed and the fact that there's a market for that you know for people who want those kind of knives and that fits their lifestyle to me just means it's an expanding market yeah, um yeah. and that's definitely a cool thing and and anything that normalizes the regular carry of knives <laughs> you mm-hmm, know mm-hmm. not just a knife but oh yeah i have this for this and that for that and this for just for fun you know yeah anything that normalizes the good. is fun yeah yeah yeah, there's this knife that um, I, I was able to check out called the Runtley Finch. Um, so Runtley is uh, a, a, a kind of a newish company, but the people who are running it uh, have been in the watch world for a very long oh, time. Wow. And so, yeah, they just they just uh, prototyped and then began releasing three models, and the Finch is one of them. This little uh, Warncliffe is a, is a cute little knife. Uh, I I don't mean that in a derogatory right. way. It's it's a great you know small pocket knife. But um, what really struck me about it was inside the box is this little instruction manual that not only tells you how to operate the knife but also gives you like nine or ten uh, rules for handling a knife. Like never hand a knife to someone open. Oh, you know, make sure cool. it's closed. 
right? Yeah, cut away from the body. You know, so you're reading this and you're realizing, oh, this is aimed at someone who might have been into their watches, but now wants to get into some kind of EDC gear, other kind of EDC gear. Um, so it's cool that they're actively pursuing on kind of a virgin market, so to speak. Yes, yes, and coming yeah. from watchmakers, to me, that's uh, that's a those are good. Uh, bona fides you know it's like uh, right 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 they know something about precision they know something about mm-hmm. design uh, yeah. what do you what do you see as the future of um you know we we've we've gone th- I, I, now these are big bold movements uh, that you know for me it was tactical folders it's always tactical mm-hmm. folders for me but you know in terms of the big trends tact and then and then uh, frame lock uh uh titanium frame lock folders and then and then we we kind of go into the like slip joint era and mm-hmm. uh and edc and i feel like that's kind of where we are um what do you see the future of regular mm. edc knife carry hmm. that's a good question it, it, it reminds me of this quote by bob loveless that i'm sure you know knife guys have seen over and over again but he describes carrying a knife or using a knife as an atavistic experience where you are able to in that moment kind of slough off all the modernity that surrounds you and go back to your caveman yes. roots you know um you're it's basically you and this tool and i've been thinking about that quote a lot and i feel like these big trends you're talking about kind of reflect some i don't know if this is getting a little bit too abstract but in my mind, I think that these big trends reflect like the momentary psyche of of the buying public, mm-hmm, you know? Mm-hmm. So that whole period of of being interested in tactical knives, I think that, that was there was a lot of uncertainty and a lot of danger and a lot of um desire to be prepared in a militaristic kind of way, especially around the early two thousands, late nineties and all that. You know, and so it makes sense that the trends and the tastes started moving in a more tactical direction. Um, when we started seeing the normalization, so to speak, of of knife carrying take place, I think that uh, the buying public, especially as it kind of, you know, put some distance between itself and events like 9-11, you know, chronological distance, mm-hmm. not necessarily emotional, but feeling like, okay, we're safer now, we're okay uh, economy's good, people are getting jobs, things like that. People started kind of getting more into the idea of having, yeah, these everyday carry knives that they can invest a little bit more in. And and you start seeing that trend shift a little. Um, this is just how I'm seeing it. I'm, I'm probably incorrect, but I just... I think you're, I think you're dead on. That makes, that makes total sense to me, but go on. And I think right now with, um, with the economic downturn you know ever since um uh like everything started slowing down a bit and people started being a little bit more frugal with with their money i think that's why these overseas companies with their less expensive knives have become so popular because it's hit us at the right time we want to save money but we still want a quality product you know so we're not going for necessarily the super expensive knives all the time there's a lot more interest in you know, these bang for your buck kind of knives, um, knives that are fantastic in their in terms of their design. Maybe they have some lesser materials, but they're able to bring that design to you at, in a much lower price point. I feel like that's kind of been uh, really exciting to people these days. But as we, you know, kind of recover from these economic downturns, as we, as we start to um, feel like, you know, uh, we don't have to worry too much about making ends meet the next day, as a society, you know, I feel like we're going to start seeing more of these higher end features in in what used to be only like custom level mm-hmm. knives trickling down into um, uh, the more attainable uh, uh, price points, you know. So like, I think one example of this, and I would say Civivi is a little bit ahead on the curve in this, but they have a few of their models that they're doing in these rosewood handles mm-hmm. and um, like a VG10 core Damascus blade. Um, it's a Chinese Damascus. It's not necessarily the most gorgeous Damascus, um, but it is a stainless Damascus. Um, and that kind of luxury that used to be associated with four, five, six, seven hundred dollar knives now being pocketable af- at, at seventy five dollars. You know, that's. I feel like we're going to start seeing more and more of that kind of um, trickling down of higher end materials. So I feel like, uh, yeah, just more. 
inexpensive fancy knives are going to start appearing on the horizon. And uh, I, I don't know how I necessarily personally feel about that, but I feel like that's kind of where it might be going. I think you're, I think that makes sense. And I'm, I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that I am no longer feeling like I am the curator of a museum who must have, you know, a, a sample <laughs> of each because, uh, you know, yeah. my, my eye is, uh, you know, attracted to a lot of different designs and, mm -hmm. and, uh, there was a time where I just wanted to have everything and, yes. <laughs> and luckily and, and, and got a lot of it and that, I've been selling it off and, you know, in Epic Snuggle Bunny's words, re reducing and refining. And that's been yes. kind of my mission because uh, there's so much out there to tempt you. I mean, you know, what's yeah. 50 bucks for another Civivi, you know, what's a, right, you know, look at that right. sweet little thing. Yeah, I love the uh, I love the little the chronic right now. That's the one that mm -hmm, I keep mm -hmm. opening up on a page. I'm like, I do not need to spend fifty bucks on a knife. I know I'm not going to carry because it it's too small, <laughs> but it's so cool. <laughs> I'm totally with you on that. Yeah, <laughs> that's what goes on in mine. So um, before we wrap, I, I I like to do a little speed round, and okay. uh, and you know, kind of kind of shows me the cut of your jib. Let's lets everyone know exactly where you stand on a lot of very very important okay. issues. Ooh, I'm nervous. And then, and then maybe when we're done, if you have a knife story, something, sure. something funny, something harrowing, something where a knife mm. saved the day, or, or just a funny story from the office. Okay. But first, the speed round to get your mind going. Mm. Okay, so it's uh, about fifteen questions, uh, one answer word. Okay. okay. Fixed or folder? Folder. Flipper or thumb stud? I'm gonna say flipper on this, but it's like sixty forty. That's not an answer. No. <laughs> okay, flipper. <laughs> Washers or bearings? Oof. Oh, man. Well, uh, bearings. I do prefer bearings. Tip up or tip down? Mm, okay, like I said, I, 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 I'll take either. <laughs> but what do you prefer? You got to prefer uh, something. What I prefer? I got I to gotta pick one. Um, okay. Come on, do it. I, do it. You know, I'm actually going to say these days I like tip down. <laughs> All right. I love that. We have renegades on this show. That's that's cool. Tanto or Bowie? Oh, Bowie. Hollow ground or flat ground? Hollow all the way. I agree. Full size or small? Actually, full size. More into the full size knives. Gentleman's knife or tactical knife? Hmm. Man, ooh, this is tough. I know... <laughs> I know the church that I pastor would prefer the gentleman's carry because <laughs> they don't want to see me preaching with this giant, you know, <laughs> Yeah, but, what is that? but I prefer the tactical knives, I think. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Automatic or Bally song? Automatic. ZT or Wii? Oh, that's tough. <laughs> yes. Uh, it, it, yeah. By design. Yeah. ZT or Wii? I will always have a soft spot in my heart for ZT. Yeah, so ZT. I'm going to go with ZT. Okay. Benchmade or Spyderco? <laughs> Spyderco, in this case. Okay. Real Steel or Steel Will? I always uh, get them mixed up. Hmm, hmm, hmm. You know, I actually haven't had too much experience with Real Steel. Um, I have had very good experiences with all the Steel Will, so I'll, I'll go with Steel Will. Okay. Milled Titanium or Spring Clip? Hmm. I actually prefer spring clips. Yeah. <laughs> Finger choil or no choil? No choil. I if you'd asked me that two years ago, I would have been completely the other way. But uh, oh, yeah, yeah, I've changed my mind. No choil. So do you kind of feel like the handle's the handle and the blade is the blade and ne'er the twain shall meet? Yeah, I think so. And and I feel like you know, some knives get that choil really good. You know, like the PM2, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, um, the the Manix, the Manix 2. Um, like, they, they're they designed, they're purpose-built for you to use that choil or not. So, it works in either direction. But there's some knives, I don't like it when a knife forces me to use a choil. Me too. Right? I feel manipulated. Yeah, yeah. And I don't like it's it. It's like watching a Hallmark movie. Exactly, exactly. And I don't like, uh, I don't like when um, I'm using the handle of a knife and prefer to use that handle, but then I have this gaping hole, you know, where there should be cutting edge. So, yeah. 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 I've come okay. around on that. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, form or function? If I'm being honest, I'm a shallow guy. I, I, <laughs> I, I like that form. <laughs> yeah. I want it to look good. <laughs> you know, I, 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 I 
I'm with you. I'm in that camp myself. <laughs> okay, so Desert Island Knife, and this is one knife for the rest of your life. One knife for the rest of my life. Oh, geez. Doesn't mean that you're on a desert island sure. you have to survive with it, but sure, sure, sure. Um, hmm, hmm, hmm. Wow. Oh man, this is tough. Uh, gosh. I'm going to hold you to it, too, and then you have to send me all the rest of the knives. <laughs> the <rest> so of <laughs> think carefully. <laughs> you know, I'm going to go with um, with a pretty safe answer. I think that the the one if I had to reduce down to just one knife that I wasn't mm-hmm. afraid of using or wasn't afraid of the secondary value or whatever it might be, it would probably be just the Chris Reeve Sabenza. Yeah, I would just go for that, you know? Interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I like hearing that it, it because... Uh, I'm not sure if it would be mine, but it might. Uh, but it is, you know, still one of the, one of the knives I reach for just for that. It's so solid. It's so pleasingly solid and nicely engineered. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it's so understated, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, yeah. it's, uh, compared to a lot of the other stuff I it's have. It's a timeless so. knife. It's going to be, yeah, it's just, it's going to be the next buck 110, you know, um, yeah. maybe not as, as carried, you know, just because the yeah. 110 was, relatively inexpensive even accounting for inflation but it's one of those classic designs that will stand the test of time for sure so you're saying we're, we're not going to see it in clamshell packaging at walmart oh yeah me <laughs> please please <laughs> tim no lunch you, know? Break, go... <laughs> you know if tim and ends up having a kid who just decides to break bad and turn the company yeah, upside yeah, down right. <laughs> chris reeve gas station oh my goodness oh jeez. So, uh, before we close, Eugene, yeah. do you have a knife story you could regale us with? Oh, man. Um, you know, the thing is, I don't have too many funny knife stories. I just have a lot of really dramatic ones. Um, Ooh. Yeah. Uh, I got into collecting knives, actually, because, um, you know, I'm a pastor uh, during the week. I have a different day job. I, I work at a surplus store during the day. Uh, but for the rest of the week, I, I, you know, pastor a small congregation. And so when I first started pastoring, like every week, I just got so many boxes. I had so many boxes I needed to open uh, just because I was ordering books constantly, commentaries on different parts of the Bible or just, you know, helpful guides for people, things like that. And so I was just opening box after box with my keys uh, and eventually decided I needed to upgrade into this, right? Um, uh, I, I need to get like a box cutter. So I went on to Amazon and found like a box of 20 cutters for like 10 bucks. And then I saw a, a CRKT. It was a Graham Razel, one of the collaborations he'd done for them. But the small one, it was the mini mm-hmm. Graham Razel uh, with ram horn scales, just this totally, um, you know, not useful blade. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, I, I, I just fell in love with it. So I thought, you know, this box of box cutters is 10 bucks. This, this uh, CRKT is 25. Um, I'm going to splurge. And so I, I bought this knife. For twenty five dollars, I thought, "Wow, this is a ridiculous amount of money to spend on a knife. How am I ever going to explain this to my <laughs> wife? You know, you know all this stuff, <laughs> right?" And so I, I get this knife, and um, yeah, like the ram horn scale on it was splitting down the middle. It was it was just in bad shape out of the box, but I love that thing so much. And yeah, I I mean I. I couldn't use it to do anything, uh, but <laughs> but it was still, I mean, in my pocket every day. And, and then one day, you know, I happened to go go fishing and um, it ended up uh, getting a little bit of salt water on it. And of course, just totally corroded up, you know, that 8CR 13 MOV just really couldn't handle anything. And so I got it home and the clip started falling off and you know, it, it was my <laughs> fault. I should have known, but yeah, it, it was just in pieces. And I, I was beside myself. I couldn't understand how could a twenty-five dollar knife, you know, be so, you know, uh, susceptible to corrosion and all that. And of course, I, I did did my research. I watched about two hundred nut and fancy videos, um, and then <laughs> realized, oh, like I was kind of swimming in the the shallow end of the pool. You know, not to say that it was a bad knife or that CRKT is a bad company. I'm mean, I actually am a big fan of CRKT. It's just. I was expecting it to perform beyond its capacity, right? And that's that's what kind of got me into researching knives and looking into them. Um, and and so it's it's funny because as I got deeper into my job as a pastor, I got deeper into my collecting as as 
as, as a hobbyist, you know, and as an enthusiast. And so a lot of my church members started coming up to me like, is that another knife in your pocket? How many knives do you have? And <laughs> there'd be there'd be Sundays where I'd be up at the pulpit with like three knives and <laughs> strapped on me somehow, you know, because I, I just walked out of the house that way. Um, and so everyone was like preparing. Are 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 you delivering a scary sermon? You know, like are you do you have beef with someone at our congregation? You know, so it's like no, no, no. It's just I'm going crazy over here. Don't worry about me. But yeah, right. yeah, yeah. But, I just learned about this amazing thing. Mm. And now I'm checking exactly, it out. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So it all started with a Graham Razel CRKT. It all started with a Graham Razel. I still have it. It's one of the few knives that I haven't sold or gotten rid of. I did fix the knife. But it turns out that um, I, you know, I picked up some tricks along the way. Um, so uh-huh. the knife works fine. Um, and I understand that it was really my false expectations that were driving my dissatisfaction with it. Uh, but still have it. Love it. Uh, take it out every now and then and play with it. So that was your first. What was the very most recent knife that you bought? Uh, let's see here. So the most recent knife that I purchased, you mean purchased or got delivered? Uh, okay, got delivered. Yeah, got delivered would be the, the Sharp by Design Void. Um, okay. Yeah, with the damascus steel. Okay, um, so what are you looking forward to being delivered? Okay, uh, what am I looking forward to being <laughs> delivered? So... Um, the big delivery that we're working towards is uh, our second baby, Theodore. <laughs> right, <laughs> so right, of course, that's, of course. That's the big thing. Um, but beyond that, yeah, I'm really just gunning for um, a Skiff Made Blades um, production, semi-production knife. So uh, I'm not sure. I think it, I, I think I've been green, greenlit to share this in in my YouTube review. So I think I'm pretty sure I can share with you guys here. But um, if you've been following the company, or even if you haven't, uh, they've they're planning on announcing a new model at blade show provided that of course it doesn't get canceled but you know i I, i'm certain they'll figure something out but around that time they're planning to uh announce a new model that's going to be in the 3.25 inch blade length kind of range and that's just uh kind of my ideal size so looking forward to that given what i've seen from them and the the culprit that I have uh, to to review right now, um, I'm just I'm just assuming that that's going to be an incredible knife. So I'm really looking forward to that. That's kind of on the horizon, I would say. Um, I do also have a Sabenza 31 on pre-order. Now that mm. I think about it, um, and I am gunning for a version four Holt Spectre. So yeah, I've got a few things that I'm working towards. Yeah, I, I saw some really cool production pictures of the 31 today. Oh yeah, with the uh, micarta natural micarta inlays going yes, in. Yes, yes, that natural yeah, micarta looks fantastic. I have a, I have a black micarta on pre order that just waiting on. So Tim, if you nice. hear this, you know, you feel free to speed that up for me. <laughs> yeah, hurry it up, hurry it up, buddy. <laughs> yeah, I know he's swamped, Eugene Kwan. Yeah. Well, we will keep our eyes out for for that review in the. Uh, in the in the near future um i know you got a lot coming up in the offing but we will keep our eyes out for your video uh thank you so much for uh thank you so much for coming on the knife junkie podcast it was a real pleasure to get to meet you and to find out behind uh find out about the man behind those awesome reviews that i can't stop watching <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate it thank you so much for having me man my pleasure got a question or comment call the knife junkies listener line at 724-466-4487 And we're back on episode number 92 of the Knife Junkie podcast and just a articulate, well-spoken, just fascinating interview, Bob, I thought, with Eugene Kwan. Yeah, yeah, and he, um, something about the way he has set up his knife life reminded me a little bit of Jim Cooper, um, the photographer, where... You know, uh, Eugene just keeps getting prototypes and such. One of the my reflections on Jim Cooper's uh, interview was the fact that he set himself up sweetly. He he takes great pictures, uh, therefore people send him his knives. So he gets to he gets these conjugal visits with amazing knives for about a week, and then he returns them, and, and he can really soak them up without having to buy each one of them mm-hmm. to experience them, which is what some of us do. And Eugene seems to have set himself up the same way. Makers entrust him with prototypes and and they really want to hear what he has to say because, mm-hmm. you know, as you mentioned, he's he's very thorough in in and are are in in articulating uh the pros and cons of a knife. Right. And and I love the language he uses and I'm gonna try and adopt some of it. Okay. That sounds good. I'll look forward to seeing those new and improved knife junkie videos. <laughs>
All right, theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. That's where you'll find all of uh, Bob's knife reviews and other videos that uh, that he does. Bob, wrapping it up here on the, the show today, final word from The Knife Junkie. Oh, just uh, don't take dull for an answer, please. I always love that one. <laughs> for Bob, The Knife Junkie DeMarco, I'm Jim, the knife newbie person. Thanks so much for joining us on The Knife Junkie Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear Hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm-hmm.